All right, good morning, everyone. I think we are live and ready to go. Um, okay, I'm just going to give it another 30 seconds to wait for everyone to come online. Um, but just for you that are there, a few house rules. Um, if you can just please keep the questions to the Q&A box, which you'll see um, on your Zoom meeting. And um, if you can also just not raise your hand during the talk, we can, we can go through all the questions after, after the presentation. Um, and yeah, I think we're ready to go. So my name is Gareth Tate. I manage the Birds of Prey program at the Endangered Wildlife Trust. And today I'm going to be talking to you about a project that I am incredibly excited about. And um, we've certainly put a lot of blood, sweat and tears into this particular project. And um, it's been really nothing short of a conservation adventure that's taken us through some of the most expansive um, and interesting landscapes in South Africa, and that being um, the Great Karoo. For those of you that have been there, you'll, you'll, I'm sure you'll agree with me, it is um, a particularly um, incredible place. It's just the, the endless horizons, and, and especially in a time like the, the current lockdown that we're, we're busy experiencing, um, I find myself daydreaming a lot about the Karoo and uh, the amazing landscapes and mountains and endless skies. Um, so, a little bit about the Birds of Prey program. So we are lucky enough to work on some of the most unique and special species, um, raptor species in particular, um, across Southern Africa. And most of these are, are highly threatened birds, as you know. Um, and it's, it takes us to all sorts of environments and habitats. And um, we are very lucky enough to be able to be exposed to some of the most uh, threatened and pristine habitats out there. Um, and a really important part and component of our project and program is uh, the use of really unique species that act as flagships for the conservation of, of really important habitats. And um, we have a, a big focus of our work um, within the Lofart region of South Africa and working on, on species that are, are usually specialist species like, like the Powell's fishing owls and, and African grass owls like I showed you before this clip. Um, that act as these custodians. So if we protect these, these specific species, you protect a host of other wildlife within these really important um, habitats. Um, and our work is, sorry, I'm just gonna go back to that. Um, our work is, is very much centered on, on the conservation of vulture species across um, Southern Africa. Vultures are amongst the most threatened animals on the planet and they all been uplisted recently to um, either critically endangered or endangered. So a lot of our work is focused on vultures and, and, and protecting their habitat and, and their safe spaces. So looking after the breeding pairs and the, and, and the, the important foraging areas for these species. Um, one particular habitat that I've grown really fond of and is quite close to my heart is, is the Karoo. And I'm going to be talking quite a lot about the Karoo today. I've been fortunate enough to, to work in the Karoo over the last 10 years or so on various conservation projects. Um, and it's it allowed me to really explore the fauna and flora of the area. And as I, as I keep mentioning, it has a, it's a really unique place, not only in terms of its geology and its, its the environment and the landscapes there, but it really has a host of, um, it's host to some incredible and unique species. Like, and, and, and a lot of them are, are often quite crepuscular and you don't really see them during the day. You have to, have to look really hard to be able to find them. Um, but it's quite a, um, a unique scenario that's brought us into the Karoo. And it's a, it's a unique scenario because it's um, working on a species that isn't essentially from the Karoo. It, it certainly um, historically forages there, but it, is, it has never really bred there. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this as we go through the presentation. Um, but to introduce you to the marshy eagle, I think I'm going to take a little bit of a step back and introduce you to the actual biology of the species and, and its current conservation status in, in South Africa. Um, so the marshy eagle is Africa's biggest, its largest eagle. I don't want to boast about um, it with other species and stuff, but it's a really incredible um, animal to work with. Um, they're very long lived. Um, some of the tag birds that we have worked with have, uh, have, have been shown to live for over 32 years. They are, a large bird, five and a half kilograms, and they occur across most of um, South so Sub-Saharan Africa uh, in the sa savanna regions, um, and they have an incredibly slow reproduction rate. So they only breed every second year, 
um, they invest so much time and energy into the, the raising of their chicks um, that they, they have a really slow fecundity and um, reproduction rate. And they, they occur across these, these this distribution in very low densities. So very um, interesting in past histories. Um, hold on, my screen is not, there we go. Right, so just to give you a little bit of a, an idea of the size of these birds, you can see that they are incredibly large birds and just holding them um, for any given time, you can just feel the weight and the strength and the absolute power of these birds. And if you look at their claws in particular, they're bigger than a human's hands and they have the crushing force um, similar to that of a, of, a, of a lion's jaw. So they have incredible power in these, in these, um, in these talons of theirs uh, to, to take out their prey. Um, so a little bit about the conservation status of marsh eagles in, in Southern Africa and South Africa specifically, they've been uplisted um, fairly recently uh, to endangered um, in South Africa. And it's estimated there's only about 800 breeding pairs in, in, in the country. So not many pairs. If you think about the, the life history and the slow breeding rate, 800 pairs are your, are your currency of your population. And that's not a big population size. Um, and what is very concerning is that over the last 20 years, marsh eagles have showed quite significant declines across their, their, their ranges and within their stronghold, which I'll talk about a little bit now. Um, so a decline of up to 60% over a 20-year period is pretty significant. Um, and what's even more concerning is that these, these birds have also declined within their traditional stronghold, so within the protected areas. So um, you, you would think that this would be a safe space for them to live and thrive, but um, a lot of work that's been done on marsh eagles um, over the last 10, 15 years has shown declines across areas like Kruger National Park, the Khalakhari, and the Thurium Pelosi Park. Um, and a lot of work has been subsequently launched to understand these declines. And dare I say, we're not even, we're not even really at a point where we've even started to scratch the surface in terms of what are driving these declines. Um, so yeah, marshy eagles are Africa's largest eagle, as I mentioned, and they, they they nest in, in large trees across um, a lot of the savannah and woody bush felt um, areas in South Africa. And as you can see, they also have a large nest. So you can pretty much climb up onto these nests. You'll see on the left hand picture is one of our climbers um, installing a, a camera up on the nest of a marsh eagle in Kruger Park. And they build these massive stick uh, structures where they, where they breed. Um, I hope this doesn't lose any of their credibilities, but marsh eagles also breed on power lines. And Okay, so we're back online. Sorry about that. So marsh eagles need to have big, uh, mature trees to, to build their nests. Um, and what has really been interesting is that they've also moved into the, the largely treeless landscape of the Karoo, where they build nesting structures on these massive power lines and pylons that support ESCOM's um, transmission lines across these really expansive areas. And as you can see in the background of this picture, there's just absolutely no trees. So these birds are depending heavily on these power lines to build their nests and breed and thrive. Um, so subsequent work done on this power line nesting population uh, by Jesse Burnt in 2015 estimated that about a third of South Africa's marsh eagle population breed and live on these, on these power lines. And uh, as I say, it's a really unique setup that's brought us into the Karoo because it's, uh, it's essentially an artificial population, um, but it has, with the knowledge that it's about a third and then a third of South Africa's um, breeding population of marshals, it has a really high conservation um, status and, and, and implications for our whole conservation around the species across their, their, their um, distribution in South Africa. So in 2018, um, the EWT Birds of Prey program launched um, a really exciting project to really understand the, the dynamics of this um, pylon nesting population. And uh, we kicked off the project in about October 2018 to, to really start getting a, a, a detailed insight into this population, whether they are actually doing well, whether they're sustaining marginal populations, or are they perhaps a sink population where Birds from the outside populations are moving in and there's a higher level of mortalities in these areas. Um, and that's all the kind of answers we're really trying to unpack around this population. Um, so we're looking at various things and they've all been extremely um, exciting. Just from the word go, we're looking at the movements of birds across this, this population. 
as well as the breeding, um, the breeding performance of the population and looking at the diet and how this may impact local species. Because as I say, they are certainly have been facilitated. Um, the movement of this whole entire population has been facilitated by the, the presence of these power lines that weren't there before. Um, so what is the impact on the local fauna and flora? Um, and then to also look at what their, their main threats are and their survival within this landscape and how this all informs the conservation of the species. Um, so one of the most unique tools and, and important tools that we've had for this project has been the use of um, aerial surveys. And we've had a lot of support from the battaliers who um, have taken us up into the air three times now. And we've been um, luckily been in the hands of, of a really good pilot, Mark Rule. And we've had a really great time just flying these, these lines over the last two years, just trying to understand where the birds are, where, what stages of breeding they're at. And it's been really, really um, important for, for the project because it's such a big area and it's, it's one of the best ways to cover a lot of ground in a, in a very short space of time. So these aerial surveys have allowed us to identify active nests, identify which species are actually nesting on them, and then seeing what breeding stage the, these different um, individuals are at. And often you, you come past and you see the birds hunkering down on their nests. Um, a very interesting part of the work is that martial eagles don't seem particularly um, scared or afraid of, of aircraft coming over. Even when you fly over quite low, you just see these big yellow eyes looking at you. Um, and we're also able to see what stage the breeding is at um, through various times of the year and what the breeding schedule is for the population. As I mentioned, they breed every second year. So often you only have 50% of the population breeding at a specific time. So it's really important to establish what the breeding schedule is for this population. Here you can see a large chick on, on a big nest that you could pretty much lie down in yourself if you wanted to. Um, and then we also often find prey. You can see here there's a big um, hindquarters of rabbit there and there's a very, very freshly hatched chick there, which is probably about two or three days old and, and we're finding some really interesting things. So the study area that we're now currently covering is about 1,750 kilometers of, of these ESCOM transmission lines. And um, we flew the lines, as I say, we've done three surveys now and we've really established a good population. Now we've, we've found and identified 187 nests across this, um, this 1,750 kilometers. And that means we've picked up about a nest every 10 kilometers. So there's a substantial population, a proportion of large eagles on ESCOM infrastructure. And uh, we'll keep talking about how important this might be for the, for the conservation of the species. Um, and we've, it's not only marsh eagles that we actually, we um, establishing and identifying on these nests. We're finding a lot of tawny eagles and verose eagles, which all have um, various levels of threats across South Africa. So they are using these power lines significantly. So after the aerial surveys, what we usually do is we head out and we, we have, we, we basically narrow down the 149 marsh eagle nests and we specifically focus on 30, 30 um, individual pairs and we'll monitor them throughout the breeding season. A lot of this is from the ground and a lot of it means spending a hell of a lot of time in the field, um, camping out under the beautiful Karoo, but often under these power lines, which keep on, they have this kind of buzz and everything feels a little bit static, um, which is quite a weird sensation. But also living out of your, your bucky quickly becomes your office and your, your kitchen and, and everything else. It becomes quite a dusty experience, but um, we spend up to about two weeks every session and we do about three sessions every um, every year. So a lot of time in the field. So I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the technology we've been using to understand this population. As I say, not much is known about, known about this population. Um, and one of the really useful things that we've been applying to the this, this project is the use of um, satellite tracking units. So we catch birds um, throughout the, the, the focal sites and we fit them with these transmitters that are pure satellite iridium. They use iridium satellites and they can pretty much function anywhere in the world. But obviously the Karoo is, is, a, is, a, it is not many comms and, and, and cell phone set reception there. So we do have to rely on satellite capabilities. Um, for those of you that are interested, we, we fit the tracking devices like a little backpack. Essentially, it sits on the bird with this Teflon ribbon, which you'll see here is, uh, is made in one mill in the world in the States. And, and it's a very strong material. It's actually the same material they use to make bulletproof vests. And then we'll put some 
knots in that actual um, harness, and those knots are actually essentially a, a weak link, which wear out after about four or five years and the transmitter falls off the bird. As I mentioned, these birds are long lived, they live for about 32 years, so we don't really need these devices on them for the whole, it would be a little bit unethical to keep the devices on them for the rest of their lives. So these devices fall off and we can go and collect them. So for the Eskom Marshall, Karoo Marshall Eagle project, we've caught 10 birds and we, we need to catch another eight to get our full study sample. Um, and this includes several adults and two juveniles which have shown incredible um, movements over the last two years since we've been monitoring them quite closely. And the important thing about tracking birds is it's opened up an entire new level of information that we, we can gather within a species. We know exactly where they hunt, where they breed, and where they really rely on the important foraging areas. And it, it allows us to answer really important questions such as, you know, what are they eating? Where are they breeding? And what are their threats? And what might be driving their, 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 their mortalities? So this is really cool. Um, just a visualization of a three-dimensional visualization of what we can actually achieve with these with these tracking devices and this is a, a bird that was tracked by colleagues of mine quite a while back um, in the uh, central Karoo and you can just see how these birds thermal and how they interact with the landscape and with the threats and, and from this we can really build information packages which tell us about the species that that no other other, other monitoring can do um, so a really really unique way so the current coverage that we have, as I say, these white lines are all the transmission lines across South Africa, and we've got a really good coverage so far. We've caught 10 birds out of the 18, but as you can see, they've got incredibly large home ranges. Um, all the blue um, icons are nesting sites that we're monitoring. Um, and then the home ranges, you can see the purple one in particular in the middle is a bird we've called OB1. Um, and he has a, a home range or dispersal range that is bigger than Lesotho. So it's close on 30,000 30, square kilometers, which is incredible. Um, and we, every single morning I wake up, uh, one of the first things I do is have a cup of tea and I look at how my martial eagles are doing. And uh, we can tell where they are, whether they are still alive and, and kicking and flying around. But we can also do some really important work, which I'll talk to you a little, little bit about now. Um, but you can just see how these birds interact with the power lines. All those lines, the black lines in this picture, are is a network of power lines. And these birds rely pretty heavily on, on, on perching and roosting and breeding on these power lines. And uh, it's something we're really trying to unpack and understand how much and how important uh, this is within in the Karoo landscape. As I mentioned, huge home ranges. This is OB1 here. Um, he's been an incredible bird. He currently has, I was wrong, he has a home range of 42,000 square kilometers. And he flies up to, on, on some days, up to 240 kilometers a day. Um, and they, they barely flap. They just catch thermals and they, they, they slope saw and they ride these ridges. Um, and they, they just ultimate soaring eagles and, and really incredible. Um, a, a few of the analyses we've done just shows that they are incredibly dependent on the power lines. I'm not going to go too much into the actual habitat analyses, but um, these birds are spending between 70 and 90% of their time on power lines. And it makes sense because it's, it's a really good perch site and, and a good hunting vantage point. Um, and also they, they can't really roost on the ground. So they're also roosting on these, on these power lines. And as you can see, um, between power lines and, and these artificial plantations that the Karoo does have, um, they certainly select the power lines more. And often, you know, when you're driving through the Karoo, you can see these little patches of, um, yeah, within, within the Karoo, you'll see little patches of, of alien invasive trees and the marsh eagles are spending a lot of time in those too. Um, so I kept on talking about the important outputs from this project. So this is pretty much all the farm um, parcels along our study site and we're engaging with the farmers all the time and um, we've actually named most of our, our eagles after the farmers and we send them regular updates um, and we've also I must say it is probably one of the most important outputs from this project is, is the direct engagement with people chatting to them about the marsh eagles. Marsh eagles certainly have been known to, to, to prey on livestock so we, we try to develop mitigation options with the, the farmers that work for them as well so it's this really important um, uh, process of educating and raising awareness around the eagles. Um, one of the exciting things that I'm busy with and I've been busy with it on the lockdown is 
developing an early warning system for, for farmers. So because we can have almost a, a real-time um, tracking of these birds, every morning I can check where they are. And if these birds overlap in areas where the farmers are, where, they lamb, where their sheep are lambing, and where there's potentially a human wildlife conflict and issue there um, with marsh eagles feeding on, on livestock, we can actually warn them. And I can get an email every, every hour that tells me where the eagles are and whether they might be interacting and, and be a little bit too close for comfort to, to farmers' livestock. Um, so yes, uh, it, 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 it certainly does help. And, and it is worth mentioning that we do quite extensive um, diet analyses. So underneath all of the nests that we're busy monitoring, we also check up on uh, what the prey base is and we collect all the prey remains. And um, I don't want to jump the gun, but so far we've only found really, really few lamb carcasses underneath marsh eagle nests, um, which does show that they are preying more on, on, wild, um, on wild prey base. Um, so yeah, it's obviously a, a challenge working throughout such a big landscape. And as I mentioned, the, the, the assistance from the bataliers has been really critical for us to cover such big ground. Um, and often we also, when we're trapping the birds, we have to sit in these hides and you, you do go a little bit loopy, a little bit worse than lockdown, but a little bit less worse than lockdown because you have a bit more of a view and entertainment with the birds. Um, but we do spend a, a hell of a lot of time in these hides and I often take my work with me to do to work inside the hides. Um, I won't go too much in terms of the, some of the close calls we've had with wildlife across the crew, but all I can say is do not mess around with black wildebeest. They can be quite uh, aggressive. And when you see these signs, definitely adhere to them. Another challenge, which is quite, a, quite amusing, um, is certainly um, the fact that the Karoo is peppered with, um, with gates. And as you can see, when they're underneath these power lines, they almost become electrically charged. And um, I've actually written it down here. We've counted that since the start of the project in 2018, We've opened and closed about 1,280 gates. So it's, it's a hell of a challenge. Um, there's often uh, really interesting things that uh, keep, you, keep you on your toes. Um, Karoo, um, Karoo traffic jam. But yeah, so it's been a really incredible project. And as I say, we're still really in the, in the beginning phases of it. And there's a lot to learn. But a lot of this research is, is going to be important in guiding the conservation strategies that we implement for, for marshy eagles in, in the Karoo. As I say, the fact that it's almost a third of the, of the national population on these power lines, it really has a high conservation significance and we need to understand them better so that we can conserve them better. And at the moment, as I say, we are still within the very preliminary phases of the project. Um, this year, we're going to be diving a little bit deeper into the tracking and the breeding of the birds. And uh, we hope that we can really guide the conservation of this globally threatened raptor. Um, that's all I've got for today. I think if you guys can, I'll look, have a look at your questions and answers, but I'd like to thank all our partners and donors for the project. And yeah, I'd really like, like to thank you for tuning in and, and sharing um, this project that we are really all excited about. So thank you very much. All right, let me try find the Q and A's. Um, just for you that have never presented online, it is a very weird sensation talking to over 100 people yeah, via, the, via Zoom. Right, so the first question we have um, is, good morning, Dr. Tate. Thank you for sharing time to give this presentation. One question so far related to what you are working with. Um, I just wanted to know if the season is record and, recorded and available afterwards for those who have missed it to watch. So for those of you that haven't been able to watch the whole Thing. This will be put on our um, on the EWT's um, channel on YouTube, so you can watch the full uh, presentation there. And hopefully, we'll, we'll be a bit more streamlined because we did have a bit of a um, an issue with the uh, with the comms today. Um, the next question is: Do martial eagles have life partners? Um, so, what we've found with our research in Kruger and both in the Karoo is that. Marsh eagles certainly do choose and breed um, with a partner. Um, and as long as that partner survives and, 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 and isn't taken out um, by whatever it may be, they will breed and, and continue to, to form basically a, a breeding pair for life. Um, but we, what we have found is it's quite, quite interesting is that when one of the birds is killed, um, it's pretty quick um, for them to replace their partner with a new partner. And we've seen it in, in, in a lot of our large eagles that we work on. 
So another comment is that my sound is gone, just to tell you that I once assisted Dr. Rob Baby, Babies in his task on stitching up the wound of a rescued Marshy Eagle chick that was found near Beaufort West. Um, that was an incredible experience for me and as an editor and publisher of Acorn Books without any prior hands on animal rescue expertise. Thanks for that, Eleanor. That must have been a really cool experience. Um, Mary Ann McKay, you asked a general question about raptors. Are they being pushed out by crows? Um, I'm seeing more and more crows and fewer raptors. We certainly are seeing the same thing across our study sites. Um, crows have always been a nuisance for raptors. They harass them. And um, in some of our work sites in areas like Mokala National Park, we have seen crows um, actually prey a predate on, on, on the eggs and nests of, of raptors, in particular um, vultures, which is concerning given their conservation status. So although we haven't got any solid proof, um, there's no real evidence showing that crows are driving raptors out of, of their distributions and out of their ranges, but they certainly do harass and, and pest them. And they are something we are concerned about and are looking into um, investigating further to see what their impact is on, on our threatened raptors in particular. Um, another question by Eleanor Mary Cadell. Um, were the marshals in the crew in any numbers before the power lines were installed? I think the mainly treeless situation in the crew. So Eleanor, I certainly think there were marshals there. Um, they do thrive in these arid areas. They have such incredible vision and, and they do rely on this to catch food and their prey and they, they can often catch food off the wing so they'll spot food up to a kilometer away and they can they trap it and they grab it like that. Um, so to answer your question, I can't, I can't tell you the exact densities. They certainly occurred here, but they, they, they would not have been able to breed without the large trees in the area. So the, the establishment and building of these pylons has definitely facilitated um, the, the, the movement of these marshals into this Karoo landscape. Um, so the next question is, um, do the eagles ever get electrocuted by power lines? Yes, they do, David. Um, they, David von Buningen. Yeah, so they do get electrocuted. We have a, um, a database that we, we've been collecting for a while and it's part of our wildlife and energy program. And we have seen that marshy eagles are certainly susceptible to being electrocuted, mainly on distribution lines, not really the lines that they're breeding on. The transmission lines, the biggest ones that you see out there are between 400 and 725 kilovolts. Um, and they, they are pretty bird safe. There, there are some collisions on those lines, but electrocutions are certainly a concern. And we are tracking birds also to identify where these high risk lines are so that we can mitigate them with, along with ESCON. Um, so the main food source of marshy eagles in the Karoo, we don't know yet. Um, we're busy analyzing their diets at, as we speak. Um, we're counting, we've, we've got bags and bags of prey remains. There's a lot of dassies, which is quite interesting because dassies do well in the crew, but it also starts, you opens up the kind of thought, you know, are they competing with Varose eagles who are native to the area, indigenous to the Karoo? Um, and, and does that mean that the marshes are competing with the Varose eagles? And that's something we also want to have a look at. But we're finding a lot of scrub hares, um, a lot of monitor lizards, um, and they're preying a lot on things like bustards and uh, Korans. So they are eating birds too. Um, how do farmers react to having them fly over their lambs and how do they protect those lambs from being predated on? It's a really, really good question. And um, as I say, marsh eagles have a bit of a bad reputation with farmers um, because they, they have been shown to, to catch livestock. Um, and, but I must reiterate that we've, we've, we've monitored the site extensively and I think only five pairs had some remains of lambs and it was also during a drought. And, it's really important to, to note that marshals also scavenge um, to a degree. So if they find dead lamb, they will feed on it. Um, but farmers generally don't like having eagles around their lambs, um, but there are ways to mitigate it, to make sure that the lambs are, are managed and, and watched properly, um, maybe with a, a guardian livestock, livestock guardian dog or a shepherd. Um, and it's, it's a, or maybe put them in, in cages and make sure that they're with, within um, an enclosure so that marshals can't get to them. But generally, as I say, marshals keep to themselves. They don't like people, they don't like disturbance, um, and they, they, 
they do tend to predate on more natural things in the Karoo. Um, the next question is, do farmers ever kill eagles? Uh, they certainly do. Um, we deal with quite a few livestock um, issues, so human wildlife conflict issues, um, where farmers have been known to shoot eagles and, and poison them. And uh, we, we often go in before this actually happens so we can actually work with them and mitigate the issues. And, and a lot of it is around um, the, 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 the more effective management of their livestock and, and monitoring of their livestock. So, so they certainly do, um, there are persecutions across the country. Um, right, next question. So how many eggs do marsh eagles lay? Um, they lay one egg. So they invest a lot of energy and time into that one egg. They don't have that insurance that some species do by laying several eggs. They lay one egg and they put a hell of a lot of in, um, effort into raising that chick, um, which is why they also only breed every second year because they put so much of the energy into that. Um, another question, Andrew Semple, have you received any injuries while handling these large eagles? Um, I've been gripped once, but not, not anything bad. Um, they generally, if you, if you see in the pictures, we, we hood them usually, and um, if it's a, a bit of a feisty bird, we will actually strap up their talons so that the bird or ourselves can't get hurt. Um, but, but generally, when you, once you hood them, they're extremely well-behaved birds. Uh, um, they don't really move around too much, and they, they are really a pleasure to, to handle. Um, next question. How, how heavy is a newborn eagle? So... As you saw in that one picture of the young chick, when they hatch, they are, they're very small and, and they pretty much, um, when they hatch, they have the, the same weight as an egg, which is about 40 grams. So they, they, do, they do hatch quite light, but they, they grow very quickly. It's incredible that within three weeks, they're um, almost fully feathered. Um, and then within another kind of five, or, within another three or so, weeks they almost ready to fledge um, and have pushed out their all their flight flight feathers so they do grow very quick um any ideas why marsh eagles are declining in national parks so it's a really interesting question and as i say work has been um really focused on on understanding these declines in, in national parks um to date the only thing that we can really tell is that the birds breeding is extremely low they have a very low productivity so the population isn't producing and recruiting enough chicks to be able to sustain the current mortality rate. So um, we found that adults do have a, a slightly um, elevated mortality rate. And a lot of the birds that um, were tagged as part of Rowan van Nieren's project in Kruger National Park actually were, were protected within the Kruger National Park. But as soon as they left they, the confines of the protected area, and this is the big challenge with, with wide ranging, highly mobile species is that they were killed outside of the park. And in fact, in 2016, we found a bird that was, was snared that had flown into a poacher's snare um, and it was caught around the neck. Uh, we've also had some incidences of persecution where the eagles were preying on chickens and they were killed um, by the, the chicken owners. So they are, they are fa faced with these threats outside of the protected areas. Um, Question here from Jason Donaldson. Do you think power lines are important in all ecosystems or just in arid systems? I think that's a very tough question to answer, Jason. Um, they, they certainly provide an opportunity for these birds to nest. And in the bigger picture where we're having this um, situation where birds are, are diminishing and, and, and rapidly declining in, in their strongholds, um, you've got to look at you know, the actual value of this artificial population and, and that's being sustained by the presence of these power lines. Um, so we all, as I say, we, we, we still are in the, in the, in the infancy of the project and, and all the questions we're trying to answer is whether this is in fact an important um, population and, and does it have an important conservation value? Does it sustain other populations? So um, it's hard to tell Certainly for marshals that do rely on them, they are important in, in an arid ecosystem. Um, I, I, I can't answer any questions outside of, of, of eagles, I, I, yeah, unfortunately. Um, next question was, if marshals historically occurred in very low densities within these mostly treeless landscapes, 
having them expand into these landscapes, do you think that they have a competitive edge over other reactors such as Veroes um, and possibly creating a com competitive exclusion? That's a really good question, John. Um, and it's something that is, is, is one of the key questions we're trying to ans answer. I keep going back to the fact that these eagles um, have, have moved into the, the Karoo and they're doing really well. They're certainly preying on, on the same things that the Veroes eagles are preying on. Veroes eagles are fortunately quite specialist um, and they, they, they do specialize on taking dusties. So that's one thing we are trying to unpack and, and trying to establish whether this is um, interspecies competition and, and is it of concern. Um, so a really good question. Next question is, is renewable energy um, a greater risk to birds of prey compared to e existing ESCOM lines? Um, so you certainly have your collision prone species uh, and I, I'm talking about collisions with um, wind turbines. Um, we haven't really assessed whether that they are more of, an, of a risk than uh, power lines. As I say, the, the transmission lines that we're working on are generally pretty bird safe. They've got um, bird deflectors and they're fitted with um, deterrents to stop birds landing on, on the high electrocution risk areas. Um, but things like, like the raptors generally um, don't collide um, with the transmission lines because of they're a little bit more visible. Um, there are issues with things like bustards and flamingos that, and, and pelicans that do certainly fly into the power lines. Um, but we are, uh, one of the outputs from this project is certainly to start looking at um, the collision risk. Um, and I'm talking about wind farms in, in particular, is the collision risk in species like Varroa's eagles and marsh eagles. And we're going to be developing these collision risk models. And um, yeah, we're really excited how this will inform um, wind, wind development and, and the presence in, of, of power lines. Um, so I'm going to take two more questions. David van Buningen, have you noticed any change in breeding season as a result of climate change? Is this something you'll be looking into? So you need quite extensive data sets to start looking at this. Um, we, we do have the luxury of having quite a big data set for this, um, for the Karoo Marshall Eagle project. Um, in 2007 till about 2009, there, there, there was work done on, they called it the Electric Eagles Project. It was also done in, in collaboration with ESCOM and the EWT. And um, there is a bit of a database there that we, we do need to start diving into to look whether there are any changes over time with, with, with climate change. It's a really interesting question and to answer. Um, final question. Have you seen any of your track eagles cross borders into other countries or start breeding there or do they tend to remain in South Africa? So the eagles in, in Kruger National Park, I can't speak 100% for that study because um, that was Rowan van Eeren's work, but they certainly went into neighboring countries. They went into Swaziland, they went into Mozambique. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the birds were actually lost in, in places like, like Mozambique. Um, quite a few birds went in there and never came back. Um, so they do cross borders, but our Karoo birds um, have remained pretty sedentary. The juveniles move a, move a heck of a lot. Um, and the adults certainly have pretty, pretty, um, yeah, pretty set home ranges of, of about a hundred square kilometers. So they, they don't move too much. They are the odd birds that go on rogue missions, but um, yeah, they are the odd bird. Okay, last question. What do the expanses of solar panels being installed in the Karoo and do they post, pose a threat? So thanks, Eleanor. Yeah, we, we have certainly had some overlap in terms of where our birds forage and move um, with existing solar panels and, and, and power uh, wind, uh, solar, solar farms. Um, they're not a threat to marshals from what we've gathered. They, they do have an issue of um, they they remove habitat for, for smaller species and potentially um, things like uh, some of the prey species for marsh eagles, but they don't have a direct impact on the marshals. I think they, they, they avoid these areas. So um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. All right, thank you very much guys. I think I'm gonna end it there. There's a lot of questions, but if you do wanna ask any more questions and that I haven't answered, please do email me at garrett at ewt.org.za. And yeah, thank you very much for your time and uh, I hope it went well. Cheers.